It is thrilling to be here tonight, a very special evening. Uh, it's my first time in the revamped New Look uh, National Army Museum, and uh, I'd like to congratulate Jasdeep and all his colleagues for what they have done to this building and this institution, and also for this evening. So I'd say thank you for that. Um, I'm here wearing two hats which confuse each other, which get in the way of each other. I'm a historian. Um, my particular research topic has been Kashmir in the 1940s. Um, but I've earned my living uh, working for the BBC until a couple of years ago. Um, I was a BBC correspondent in Delhi, and I first came across stories about partition. Um, stories, I use stories both as a journalist and a historian, but these are not fictional stories. These are the lived experience of partition. When I uh, made a series of radio programs, as just deep said, for the 50th anniversary of partition, and I spent four months traveling across South Asia, basically from Raul Pindi to Nawakali. Um, and I wasn't at all concerned with the Brits. I wasn't concerned with the high politics of partition. I wanted to get to the lived experience. Um, and as I talked to people, I did in total more than 200 interviews, and they're now at um, the archive at SOAS in, in Bloomsbury. Um, there were two types of people who'd lived through partition who shared memories. One were the people who told those stories so often that you know, their, their kids and grandkids would say, oh, it's granny talking about Lahore again. And then there were others who had never shared those stories. So their children their grandchildren knew a little bit about where their forebears were at partition, but had never heard in detail those stories. They'd not been volunteered, and they'd not been sought. And it was often quite a privilege to hear people tell memories, very raw, personal, painful memories, but by and large, people wanted to share those memories. There wasn't much reticence. People here wanted to have, people wanted respect for what they'd been through. But in terms of how we remember partition, we do it above all, I think, through images. I don't know if you know who took this photograph. It's uh, not uh, one of the great Indian photographers, Matanjit Singh or Sunil Jhana. It was taken by Margaret Bourke-White, uh, the American war photographer who took the most iconic images of partition. This is Puranakila in Delhi, uh, a few weeks after independence where Muslims gathered, as they did at Homeyan's tomb, uh, before they made the journey west into what had become Pakistan. This is quite simply the most famous uh, and easily recognized of the partition images. It's on the covers of two of the books on sale in the shop this evening. It's on the cover of the 1947 partition archive brochure. Again, it's Margaret Bourke-White, uh, Sikh refugees heading east in 1947. The reporter who accompanied her, she was working for Life magazine, uh, said, we were there for hours. She told them, the refugees, to go back again and again and again. They were too frightened to say no. They were dying. Those are her words. But Margaret Bourke-White wanted the photograph. It is an iconic photograph. Whether ethically that's justified, I will leave for you to decide. That is Margaret Bourke-White, a vivacious character. Uh, she wrote a book about uh, India in 1947. I say India rather than India and Pakistan. It was much more India. And she commented, I witnessed that extremely rare event in the history of nations, the birth of twins. It is remarkable that India and Pakistan gained their independence at the very same moment at the midnight hour as August the 14th, 1947, moved into August the 15th, 1947. But they still celebrate independence on different days. The 1940s were a period of intense dislocation. There has never been in the modern world a decade where there was so much forced population movement. And that's part of the context of partition. In China, a quarter of the population, 90 million people, moved in the course of the 1940s as a result of war or famine or political upheaval. Here in Europe, if we are in Europe, um, 14 million at least Germans at the close of the Second World War 
fled or were expelled from Central or Eastern Europe. It's uh, a fact which is actually largely lost from the European historical narrative. That is still regarded as the biggest ethnic cleansing in the history of the modern world. In India, we talk about the numbers, the terrible numbers who died at partition. The Bengal famine during the Second World War killed more. It killed more than two million in a famine which, uh, for which the British imperial authorities bear a significant degree of culpability. Having said all that, partition and the violence that accompanied it was one of the most catastrophic events of the last century. We can't be clear about the figures. We don't know. But it is likely that about 12 million refugees uh, moved across the new borders, both on the Punjab and the Bengal flanks. And, of course, a significant number of Muslims, particularly from uh, UP, moved willingly and enthusiastically to Pakistan to help build the new Muslim nation. Estimates of those killed range from about half a million to two million, and about 80,000 women uh, were abducted, uh, almost all by men of a different religious community. That's the map. I have to admit, it's not quite the full map. We haven't quite disclosed that Hyderabad and Junagar and Goa and Pondicherry were not part of independent India. But when Jinnah complained of getting a moth-eaten Pakistan, you can sort of see what he means. One part of Pakistan there, another part of Pakistan there, and a thousand miles between. And Kashmir, well, Kashmir was different because the Maharaja had not at that stage decided which country he was going to accede to. The biggest turbulence, the greatest catharsis, the most painful ripping apart was in Punjab. Punjab and Bengal were provinces which were dissected within a matter of five weeks and one day by a British lawyer who had never been to India before and never returned. The new boundary was only published two days after independence. So tens of millions of people celebrated independence not knowing whether they were in India or Pakistan. This is the Civil and Military Gazette, the uh, Kipling's uh, one-time newspaper published in Lahore, Division of Punjab Province, August the 19th is the date of that edition. The lived experience of partition was lost sight of for years and indeed decades behind the political story of division and of nation building. Um, Bollywood was slow to tell that story. Uh, Garam Hava, uh, it translates perhaps best as Scorching Wind, was the first really big Hollywood movie that addressed partition, the lived experience of partition head on. That was in 1973 with Balraj Sani. Fiction was quicker and more successful, so Manto's short stories are the most chilling literary depiction of partition in Punjab. But there's also Tamas Bishamsani, which was turned into a TV series in the 1990s. Kushwant Singh celebrated Train to Pakistan, which uh, perpetuated the story of the ghost trains where everybody on board had been killed in the course of that migration journey. The River Churning, based in Bengal. Krishna Baldev Vade's The Broken Mirror, a very detailed account of his own experience of living through a partition riot in Dingar in West Punjab. Uh, and my personal favourite, Babsi Sidva's uh, Ice Candy Man, the account of living through partition as a young girl, a Parsi, in Lahore. Historians, and I speak as a historian, were really quite remiss in getting to grips with the lived experience. For decades, historians wrote about Jinnah and the Muslim League and Mountbatten and why and when, but they didn't get to grips with what happened to people. That changed only really 20 years ago, and the big breakthrough was Ravashi Bhutalia's book, The Other Side of Silence, which looked at the experience of women, of children, and indeed of Dalits in partition, which had never really been explored rigorously before. Uh, and that opened up a whole new area, and that began the drive to collect stories and narratives, which we see reflected by the great initiatives which are 
have been uh, talking about their work uh, in the foyer. But what I want to do is just to play you a few extracts from programs that I made 20 years ago when I sounded rather different, so you may notice that, brief extracts, which are about some of the stories that I gathered and what I think they tell us about what happened in partition. The partition violence began a year before partition, before partition was even uh, uh, certain to happen. The biggest ruction, the biggest outbreak of communal violence, the one that started the spiraling out of control, was Direct Action Day in Calcutta on the 16th of August 1946, when the Muslim League uh, called a large rally to demand Pakistan, which led to violence in which about 4,000 Calcuttans were killed in the course of two days. On the 16th, Direct Action Day, trouble started shortly after dawn. Rashid al Hussein was then a young Muslim boy living in a mixed area in the heart of the city. That day in the morning, at about half past six, I just got up from the bed and was brushing my uh, teeth. Then all of a sudden, I saw that uh, there is next to my grandfather's house, which is opposite to our house. And I saw that people attacked, Muslim Muslim, people attacked that house. They were trying to break the uh, door. That is the first time I saw a young lady of 16 who's completely naked. He has been dragged from the inside of the house. How they have killed, I don't know. There was no blood. They are pulling her by the legs and just dropped just in front of me. I was in the first floor. Most of the people obviously showed signs of being intoxicated with alcohol or with enthusiasm and they carried huge uh, portraits, imaginary portraits of Jinnah leading the battle of the hordes against the infidels, you know, that sort of atmosphere. And the first victim I saw was a poor porter, Hindu, and he had just come into this side street, and there a Muslim in a lungi broke away from a procession with a iron rod and hit him on the head, you see. The processions were making their way to a massive Muslim League rally in central Calcutta. So too, still unaware of the scale of the rioting, was Badruddin Umar. His father was Bengal secretary of the League and one of the main speakers. I never saw such a huge crowd ever in my life. And before the meeting started, there was a great lot of agitation. And people were shouting all around that uh, riots had broke out, you see, in this area and that area. And Muslims are being slaughtered, you see. And you are not doing anything, etc. And they were shouting at the leaders. And other people were trying to calm them. And then Khaja Nazimuddin, he made quite a communal speech. He said that uh, we have to fight against the Hindus, etc. But then... Uh, in the rostrum also, there was opposition against what he was saying. But the situation was such that the meeting could not be continued for long. My name is Samrita Pritam. I wrote the poem, Aj Akham Varishyano. And I feel satisfied that it is being sung both sides of Punjab, even today. The poem depicts the pain endured by the women of Punjab at the time of India's partition. It's an appeal to an ancient poet to return and witness the fate of Punjab's women folk. Written by a poet herself making her way as a refugee across North India in the autumn of 1947. I was so sad, lost everything. And uh, while traveling in the train, all around there was darkness. Then I could remember only Barsha. He's our beloved poet. So I addressed him. 
see how your Punjab is ruined. You met only one girl here and wrote a long saga, beautiful saga of her pain, suffering. Now the lads of the daughters of Punjab are weeping. And then I, I had no paper proper, just a little bit paper in my purse because I was traveling. I'm sorry. It is so painful to remember. A human being is still, I think, uh, not matured enough. No inner evolution is there. They are just like animals. If they find uh, opportunity, why to attack women? Why to rape them? Isn't it the insult of their own bodies, but they don't realize it? One of the great conflicts as a program maker who's also an oral historian is emotion. As a program maker, emotion is gold dust. Tears are powerful, and yet there's this terrible sense of intrusion. Uh, and it's something that I'm still conflicted by. Clearly, you know, I didn't invite Amrita Pritam to break down in tears, but it was very unsettling because I'd only been in her presence for 15 minutes and she was sobbing as she told her story. And that was something that, and people tell their stories in different ways, but that was something that wasn't unusual, that people would, as they told their story, they would break down um, as they recalled episodes which perhaps they hadn't shared very much even with their family members, or in some cases episodes which they had shared a great deal, and it was always, it had almost become a sort of personal performance. I mean that respectfully, but a, a performance. Um, but I thought it was really important to find uh, not just the testimony of people of reputation, of standing, of influence, but also those who are less influential, more marginalized. Um, and I went with a colleague to um, an ashram that I'd heard about in Jalanda, in Indian Punjab. Um, I'd actually heard that I.K. Gujral, the at that time foreign minister, had set up an ashram for women who had been uh, left stranded by partition. In fact, when we got to that ashram, there was nobody there apart from a caretaker. But in the serendipitous way that things sometimes work, he said, but there's another ashram in another part of town, and I think there's some people there from partition. So we went to the Gandhi Vinita Ashram, which at that time still had a very small number of women who'd been living in institutions ever since 1947 or shortly after. They were set up to uh, give housing and shelter and vocational training to women who'd been abducted and retrieved. The sewing room in the Gandhi Vanita Ashram or Sanctuary in Jalanda in Indian Punjab. The women are making sheets, mosquito nets and kit bags for the Punjab police. It's well run and the supervisor has every reason to take pride in her institution, even if some of the inmates have been there an unconscionably long time. The women who were originally here came, uh, were destitute, uh, um, resulting out of partition, uh, the women and their children. But there are people living here still who were here when, almost when this ashram started. Three families, then. yeah. That's partition ke time. Ke. Three families are still here who came here in, in the partition days. That's right. They've been here for oh. 50 years. 100. It's a long time, isn't it? Oh. Yeah. 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 The women who, uh, the few remaining women who came here um, after partition um, uh, want to remain here. They say that they, they, they don't want to go anywhere else. In fact, the, uh, the old lady says she, only her dead body will leave this place. We didn't have to cajole the older residents into talking to us of their ordeals. They came and sought us out. 
and told us to sit and listen. I'm telling my story as quickly as I can, said Prakashvanti, but I've waited 50 years to tell it, so please be patient. She's a Hindu, born and brought up in what became Pakistan. She, her husband and young son, along with hundreds of other non-Muslims, took refuge in a local rice mill. But looters attacked, took away all their possessions, and then took out her husband, searched him, and discovered their hidden money and jewelry. When her husband returned, he told her that the attackers, having taken as much booty as they could, were turning their eyes on the women. <laughs> He said to me, they are going to dishonor you. They've already started taking away young girls. It would be better if they killed you. If you agree, he said, I'll kill you myself. I lay down with my son. Before I knew what was happening, he hit me with a big sword. Look here, here, on my jaw. I've still got the wound, and here. And he hit me here. It was my husband who hit me. My son was also hit twice. I didn't know what was happening. I was in terrible pain. I felt as if a mountain was being thrown on top of me. When I woke up, some men were standing around me, Muslims. Afterwards, a Sikh boy put some water in my mouth. He said, here, sister, drink, drink some water. But my mouth was full of blood. And then it was night, and two girls helped to hide me. The looters had killed my husband and my little boy. In the middle of the night, about four in the morning, I think, I crept back and saw their bodies. My son's body had already started bloating. Parkashvanti made it over to Amritsa. She was pregnant and gave birth to a daughter. She's lived in various ashrams ever since. She seems never to have come to terms with the fact that the wound which still disfigures her jaw had been inflicted by her own husband. I mean, it's important to say that uh, all communities were victims and all communities were aggressors. Mridullah Sarabhai, here with Gandhi, uh, began an Indian program after independence to retrieve abducted women. And there was a similar initiative in Pakistan. It was very effective. Tens of thousands of abducted women were located and returned. But what was rather chilling is the women themselves had absolutely no agency. If a woman who was abducted was found, she had no choice. She had to be returned. And returned sometimes means not returned to where she came from, but to return to the country which her religion suggested she had allegiance to, which she may never have set foot in before. Um, I spoke to a woman called Sheila Sengupta, who worked with Mridullah Sarabhai. Her job was retrieving abducted Muslim women in Delhi, and she worked mainly in the Bogle district of the city. In summers, the group of volunteers used to go, ladies used to go to some area. We have come to know that this area, there some Muslim girls are there. So some ladies will go and sit there and say, that uh, I want to drink water. Okay, come, we we'll drink water. Uh, are you all happy? Yes, we are happy. I said, what about you? I said, what? You know, my husband has uh, kidnapped, uh, uh, abducted a Muslim woman staying with us. Then this other lady of that area will say, oh, you know, in that house, some Muslim girls, in that house, some Muslim girls. This is how we used to get the information. So sometimes, the informations were collected. Winter times to recover them. Because in winter, in uh, northern India, it's very severe cold. So they like to be indoors at night. So the recovery unit used to go with women and uh, men to recover these girls. Uh, this is Korshed Italia. Um, an elderly Parsi woman who, when I met her, was living in Connaught Place in the centre of Delhi. She's the mother of a friend, um, a friend who works in me the media and who I knew well. And it was the friend who said, oh, you must talk to my mother. She was a, a, a volunteer hospital worker during partition in Delhi. And I went to interview uh, Korshed Italia, and I couldn't work out why her daughter 
kept walking into the room that we'd set aside for the interview and distracting and coming in looking for things and, and making a bit of a noise and losing the thread of the conversation. And I said afterwards to her, why did you do that? I was trying to do an interview and it just wasn't helpful. And she said, I'd never heard those stories. I knew my mother was a volunteer worker, but I'd never heard the stories. And the stories were um, really dreadful. She was part of a group of women who would meet the trains coming in from Punjab. And their job was to get to the unaccompanied women before the brothel keepers. And then they would uh, try and make sure that the women got medical attention. They would take them to a facility in Delhi. Uh, they would organize treatment. On occasions, they would organize abortions. And then eventually, they would try to reunite the women with their husbands. At stage came when men came to ask for their women. This is this was uh, this is my wife. And the moment uh, he knew that she was pregnant, no, I won't take her back. And you could see when an educated man came, he would not take his women back. Very few did. They said, no, we don't want them back. And mind you, a villager would come and ask and say, well, it's not her fault. Never mind, I'll accept her. And they took them. So it was the villagers who took ladies who were pregnant, caring. Yet they took them. But educated men did not. I remember the vigor with which she said that. The villagers would take their women back. The educated men would not. And it's still, 50 years after the event, it still made her really cross. I've only got a very, very short while left. Um, but as this is the National Army Museum, I thought I ought to say just a little bit about the army, and particularly those Europeans who were still uh, in South Asia, deputed to either the Indian or Pakistani armies. Europeans were almost entirely untouched by the partition violence. They were hardly ever targeted. The number of European casualties in partition violence is probably in single figures. It is vanishingly low. They were not the targets. But of course there are exceptions. And in Kashmir, where the rhythm of events was slightly different, Tom and Biddy Dykes uh, were killed in a Catholic mission hospital, which was attacked by basically an army of Pakistani irregulars, which was trying unsuccessfully to snatch the Kashmir Valley from India to make it part of Pakistan. Uh, and they are buried, uh, he's buried in the only Commonwealth war grave in Kashmir. I'm not quite sure quite why it's a war grave, but um, uh, it is. And his wife, a nun, and the three other people who are killed are buried in the same small splot, uh, plot. Um, Biddy Dykes, the woman, had gone to the hospital to give birth. It had a good reputation as a maternity hospital give birth to her third child, uh, a son. Her three sons survived. They were then aged five, two, and two weeks. One of those three sons is now dead. The other two are returning to Kashmir uh, in October for a small ceremony at their parents' graves. And it's the first time they will have been together to those graves. And I'm gonna go with them. So that's gonna be me in Kashmir in October and I think quite a moving and special event. <laughs>